Hello everyone, and welcome to Bingo Bongo Learning's free webinar series for EFL ESL teachers. I'm your host, Jeremy Lanig. Uh, I am the creator of the webinar series as well as the founder of Bingo Bongo Learning. If you're watching live on Zoom, uh, I want to say thanks. And if you're watching the recorded webinar after the fact, I also want to say thanks. Uh, everyone's participation and contribution will make this project uh, all the better. So let's jump right in and talk about future-proofing English lessons. All right, well, actually, before uh, we talk about that, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit more about myself. My name is Jeremy Lanig. I have a master's degree in mathematics. I studied topology and analysis. Uh, if those words don't mean very much uh, in the mathematical sense, don't worry. They're probably uh, unfamiliar to most people. But the one thing uh, to keep in mind with, with people who studied math at the graduate level is it's not big numbers. It's not adding and subtracting big numbers. Abstract mathematics is creating problems that do or do not exist necessarily and solving them. And you're not looking for any solution. You want to find the most efficient, the most elegant, um, the best solution possible. And so for me, I, it was great. It was fun. I enjoyed it a lot, but it was too abstract. And I thought I would rather be applying these problem-solving skills to other things that uh, mean more to me. And so I finished my master's degree in 2003, and I moved to Japan in 2006. I was on the JET program for five years. I was an ALT for three of those, and then a CIR. So ALT is an assistant language teacher, uh, an English teacher in the elementary or junior high schools. And the CIR is a, co a coordinator for international relations, basically uh, using Japanese to uh, plan events, do translation, anything that's more of the, the culture side rather than the language side. Anyway, uh, I finished the JET program and I didn't have a job lined up. So um, I ended up getting really lucky and a friend of a friend of a friend was like, hey, I'm going to quit my, uh, my English school. If you want to come in and, and take over, I'll introduce the students to you and you can, you know, have a go, start your own business. And I thought, okay, sure, why not? And so that's how I started Step by Step a Kaiwa, which is now primarily uh, an, a kid's a Kaiwa, which means conversation school. Uh, I believe in China they're called tra English training schools. Um, yeah, and through that adventure, uh, I found that I needed to uh, have a curriculum that was... Again, based on my, my mathematical problem-solving um, background, I need to have something that's really efficient uh, and works really well. So I created the, the Bingo Bongo curriculum uh, as a solution to many of the problems that I encountered over the last 10 years of uh, operating uh, and managing step-by-step. -step. So at this point now, I, I teach uh, kids from the ages of one up until typically junior high school. We do teach some adults. Uh, we teach online. We teach in the classroom. Um, private lessons, group lessons. I also am an ALT still at a junior high school. Uh, so I'm teaching 20 to 30 hours a week. Plus, I'm still developing all of our songs, our books. I, I write all the code for our, our software, our programs. So you can see that um, I'm, I'm really busy and I need something that works and I need something that's prepared in advance and is not going to take any of my time. Uh, so that's to give you a little bit about our curriculum. But uh, let's go ahead and keep moving forward and talk about the topic uh, of today's webinar series. Um, or I should say webinar. Uh, so what is the future of ESL, EFL education? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about theory and then we'll jump in with some some practical uh, applications uh, of the topic. Now, uh, most of us, if you if you asked this question two years ago, before the pandemic started, what is the future of ESL, EFL education? Most people probably wouldn't have said, oh, it's going to be online teaching with Zoom and, and e-learning. And I think it's hard to predict the future. Um, but we saw that in the last two years, it can change very, very rapidly. So I'm in a few different groups around online, and I, occasionally I'll see uh, these these articles of like, "Hey, this new classroom is completely taught by robots," or you know, "Robots are the future of this and that." And you're like, "Oh no, are we going to be replaced by robots?" You, there are a lot of jobs in the world that have you know vanished because of robots. So are we going to be the next to go, the English teachers? 
Uh, what else, you know, what other headlines do I see that, you know, scare me? Uh, no need to, you know, study in school. You can learn a language in, in three days using, you know, a new app. And people think, oh, apps are the future. And, hmm, I don't know. Is that is that true? Is that something we have to be worried about? Uh, and then, you know, uh, a lot of teachers I hear say, oh, well, check out this cool new, this new device, this new technology. Uh, I can use this in my lessons. And uh, a funny story, actually. Uh, I have a daughter. She's two years old uh, this month. And her grandmother, her Japanese grandmother, bought her one of these similar, you know, devices for a Christmas present. And it's really fun. You, you know, you click it and the, you can use, you can say the words in Japanese or English. But it's funny because my daughter kind of lost interest pretty much right away. She like turns it on, plays with it, and then just takes off. So is it really uh, an effective learning tool um, that we can use? Uh, I don't know. So there's all kinds of questions about the future um, of technology uh, and, uh, yeah, language and the merger of those. So um, the first thing that I would like to settle is, are we going to be replaced by robots? And uh, I'm pretty sure the answer is no. Um, th there's actually an article. I'll go ahead and pull it up uh, online and, and read some of the the uh, details from it. But I, on Google, I searched jobs that have been replaced or will be replaced or maybe won't be replaced by computers and AI. And I found an article. It's 12 jobs that robots will replace and won't replace in the future. Uh, so jobs that have been replaced or will be replaced. Customer service executives, bookkeeping and data entry, receptionists, proofreading, manufacturing and pharmaceutical work. All right, these make sense. Retail services. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of surprising that now you go to a lot of stores and the, the checkout process is automated. Uh, you hear about these, you know, new Amazon stores where you walk in, you grab something, you walk out, and it's already been deducted from your account. You never interact with a human. You never have to even do the checkout process. It's all automated and, and done by computers. Uh, courier services, you've got Amazon who are like, oh, we're going to use drones to uh, deliver all of our goods. Um, doctors, I'm not sure that you can replace all doctors, but according to this article, robot surgeons, maybe they will make less errors than humans, uh, be more uh, effective at certain types of treatments. Uh, soldiers maybe will be replaced in the future. Uh, I see some you know, videos here and there of, of what the robot, robot soldiers are doing now. It's, it's really scary, scary stuff. Uh, taxi and bus drivers will be replaced. Uh, again, electric cars or autonomous cars. Market research ana uh, analysts. So maybe AI is going to get smart enough that it can kind of predict um, you know, the future of, of markets. Security guards. Um, and I'm sure you can probably think of some others that have been replaced already. Now, according to this article, 12 jobs that AI can't replace. Human resource managers. Writers. Lawyers chief executives, scientists, clergymen, psychiatrists, event planners, graphic designers. That one's interesting for me. Um, public relations managers, software developers, and project managers. Now, it's interesting that teachers are not on the list in either, um, in either case. Uh, have been replaced, will be replaced, or won't be replaced. But uh, I think that we can safely argue uh, that yeah, no. <laughs> Robots are not going to uh, replace teachers. And we can kind of think about why that is by just thinking about the limitations of robots or AI. So what are the things that robots can't do? Robots lack empathy, communication. Um, and uh, teachers are, are basically, our main goal is communication. That's what we teach is communication. So if, if robots can't do that, um, I don't think they're going to be able to replace us. Critical thinking. Uh, we use critical thinking all the time on our job. We have to decide uh, if you know, the lesson plan is working, if the students are enjoying it. But on top of that, we also have to teach critical thinking. Uh, and so not only as these can be skills that we, we think of as teachers needing or having, but also skills that we should be teaching our students. And by teaching our students these skills, we're going to give them more tools and options as they grow up and start working in a field that's more and more dominated by the AI or robot workforce. Uh, robots lack, number three, emotion. 
Uh, if you're not, if you can't connect with your teacher, if you don't have that student teacher connection, it's going to be pretty hard to motivate your students. Number four, creativity. I think every lesson I teach is based on some kind of creative aspect, whether it's a, a craft or doing some kind of fun activity. So yeah, creativity is crucial for our job and uh, strategy. We we need to strategize our lesson plans, our curriculum, um, and think about you know the best way to approach. Uh, in English education. So yeah, robots can't really replace English teachers. That's uh, pretty obvious, but I just wanted to run through those skills because it will be uh, important to talk about these uh, in terms of what we teach our students, like I mentioned. Okay, so the good news, yeah, we always will have a job. Now, uh, the bad news, is it bad news or, or not? I don't know. Technology will continually change the way we teach. So I think to future-proof our lessons or to, to be effective teachers in the future, we have to really um, think about our jobs in terms of how technology is changing and constantly evolving. All right, so um, what would be some advice for uh, moving forward in the future, uh, future-proofing lessons? All right, so um, the first thing is probably be flexible. If, if the pandemic has taught us one thing, uh, it's that you can't not you can't hold on to one set style of lesson plan or curriculum. Uh, if everyone goes online, you have to go with them. Uh, if if you're teaching at a school and they implement a new system or a new type of technology, you have to be able to use that to the best uh, of you know your ability and to make it most the most uh, I guess effective or efficient for your your students. All right, so being flexible. Uh, again, these are very vague uh, in general at this point, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at some, some more specifics soon. Uh, being prepared. How do you prepare for something you can't foresee? Nobody saw the pandemic coming. Nobody thought, oh, I need to have a full online you know, ready curriculum or I need to have all of these webcams and be prepared with this, these different types of software. But um, you know, now we know and thinking into the future what other skills... Uh, what are the ways can we prepare? Uh, just having that kind of mindset will probably be pretty beneficial. And then here's my uh, big point as a mathematician. Be efficient. Uh, if you can create the most efficient lesson plans, the most efficient curriculum, if you have everything is, is efficient and um, working smoothly, that'll give you more time and more resources to be flexible, to be prepared, and to work on improving other things. Like I said, I'm a teacher, but I'm also a business owner. So uh, as a teacher, uh, having an efficient curriculum is great. It saves me time, and it helps me um, teach my students more in a shorter amount of time. As a business owner, it allows me to uh, maybe get more students or uh, add new components to our curriculum. So, yeah, um, future-proofing really is, I think, uh, depends on being flexible, prepared, and efficient. Okay, so uh, some specifics um, are these two things. We can take advantage of blended learning and we can take advantage of flipped learning or the flipped classroom. Now, these, these concepts are not earth-shattering. They're not very, um, they're not new, but the terms might be new to some people. I've been in the industry for 10 years and actually I just heard both of these for the first time last year, but they're not uh, anything that we, we don't already know. So what is blended learning? Blended learning would be taking a physical or traditional method of teaching or a traditional resource, a flashcard or a worksheet, and combining it with something that's uh, you know, interactive or uh, combining technology. So you're using an, uh, a DVD could even be you know, the combination of a DVD together with a worksheet. That would be blended learning. You're blending uh, new technology with old traditional methods. All right, that's pretty straightforward. Most people, most teachers use CDs, DVDs, uh, and now a lot of different apps or devices. Okay, so what is flipped learning? Um, flipped learning is something that we, we tried uh, several years ago. We tried to implement, and we had mixed results. Uh, some students, we, th uh, we thought it was really successful for them, but for some students, it wasn't working. And it wasn't a problem with the concept. It was a problem with the implementation of it. So I'll get into the details of that in a minute, but um, flipped learning means the kids go home and they learn the new concepts, the new words, uh, the new content before they come to class. 
And if they've learned the material, they come to class, then as a teacher, I can focus on applications of the, the new content. I can focus on speaking, communication, or doing activities that will reinforce or review the materials uh, that they learned at home. So if every student goes home and learns all of the vocabulary for a unit, then you can start um, your lesson in a completely different way. But if only half the students learn the vocabulary and half don't, what do you do? You have this problem. And this is something we were encountering um, even a couple years ago. But as of last year, we, we implemented a whole new system, which uh, overall has been really, really successful in my opinion. So um, what have I done specifically in my school? What have I done to future-proof lessons? I would like to uh, go through two specific exa examples, and these are specific to the Bingo Bongo curriculum and, and the way that we teach at my school, but I think the ideas can be applied um, to a wide variety of different curricula, if you're from America, curriculums, <clears throat> and um, the first thing I'm going to do is explain our new QR code-based at-home challenge system. And what this is, is it's a way for us to um, create a blended, excuse me, a flipped learning system that has a really high success rate. So rather than having half the kids go home and do it and half the kids not do it, we have everyone doing it, everyone's learning, and we're getting uh, better results in the classroom just from the, the I think, eight months that we've, we've put it in place. So what are we doing? <clears throat> uh, let me switch my camera here. And the idea is that, well, we have a physical worksheet that we give to all of our students. Um, our, our curriculum is actually based on, on five books. Uh, here are four of the books in the series. But we have 1,200 pages uh, in the series. Uh, it's 10 years of lessons just kind of ready to go. Uh, but the nice thing is that every single page tears out. And... Again, it's, it's all about creating a simple system where kids, they take this one page home, they do their homework, and they bring it back. We sign off on it. If you have a workbook, textbook combination, the kids are like, what page was it in the workbook? And it's, it's kind of overwhelming. But by reducing the number of steps in any, in any process, you're going to have a better success rate is what we found. So we tear out the worksheet. And for every single level, for every single uh, assignment, um, we, we basically create this, this page of QR codes and staple it on. And then the kids, what they can do, uh, let's look at this one here, is after they uh, scan the QR code and they do the activity, then they will go ahead and they color the, the I did it. They check it off and then they get to do it three times. And they bring that back to us. We sign off on it and we reward them with stickers um, from a different, you know, a program that we've, we've created. Okay, so <clears throat> how is that any different than having them go home and watch a DVD or listen to a CD track? Our old system was to have them uh, go home and do that. And if they did it, they put the CD in the player or the computer or there's so many devices. Some kids drive to school. Some kids, okay, already we've got our, uh, a bunch of different um, scenarios that are, is going to cause an, an issue. <clears throat> but then, um, yeah. They put the CD or the DVD in. They're like, okay, what track is it? And there's so many other things that they can get distracted by. And then maybe the, the, the DVD just continually plays and they don't watch it three times. Anyway, it's just, it wasn't as smooth or as simple as it needed to be. And so that's where our new system um, works really nicely. When they scan any of these QR codes, what it does is it launches our, um, our new app. It's called the, the Bingo Bongo Fun Box. We can take a look at it here. And basically, if I were looking at a page uh, of a worksheet here, let me pull up the worksheet I was just holding. This is from Fun Book 3, page 121, and I hit go. And so in the Fun Box, um, check it out. I've got uh, the worksheet that they have is now on my screen. And so I can uh, quickly, you know, if I'm a, a classroom teacher, then I can throw this on the, on the TV or on a tablet, on a computer. If I'm an online teacher, now I can, you know, zoom in, zoom out, and I can explain things very quickly. I can use my drawing tool. Looks like I've got some leftover drawings here, but I can erase all that. <clears throat> and so, yeah, I can use my, my drawing tools and do some interactive online teaching if I needed to. I can complete the worksheet in the lesson, in the classroom, as they work through it um, and we can communicate as we do that. But then on the left-hand side here, 
you can see I have a, a, a lot of different um, resources. So by clicking each tab, I pull up one resource connected to this, this worksheet. So here's the worksheet solution. If I need to do uh, show them or have them just open this, then they could do that at home with a QR code. If I wanted them to maybe practice the, the chance, let's go ahead and listen here. Choose, chose, choose, chose. So now we've got um, our videos are integrated into the phone box with this worksheet. Um, if I needed to use some interactive flashcards, I have these ready to go. So save money, save money. And let's zoom out here a little bit. <clears throat> okay, and so uh, we've got more and more. We've got uh, a hangman style game here where I have to choose. Choose. Let's see if I can turn that off here. Choose C, H. If I get it wrong, the alligator appears and he'll chomp my words. Let's go ahead. I like to see that animation. It's fun. There are no... There... Oh, no. Chomp. All right, so the word was choose. Anyway, this is a fun thing that uh, the students can be doing. Uh, maybe a word search. So this is really nice because I have one worksheet and just tons of different resources that can be using. Now, when they scan the QR code, what happens is it launches one resource with no other menus. They can't go to any other page. They can't go back. They can't go forward. They just do it, and then they close it, or they use it, and they close it. Okay, so this is really cool because after the pandemic, we've seen that everyone can use their smartphone. Pretty much every one of our students um, or their parents could use their smartphone or a tablet or any other device to access online content. So we found that, yeah, having that be our, our device of choice, so that's how we're going to implement that technology um, together with the fun box. Okay, so now uh, we're going to have these, these um, QR codes prepared in advance if you want kind of a standard, um, you know, maybe a, a song, a flashcard set, a game, and the solution pack. But maybe if I wanted to go in and create my own, um, let's see, I'm going to create my own worksheet or my own QR code system here. It's really quick. So what I do is go, okay, uh, worksheet solution. Yeah, I want that QR code. And I come over here and I hit add to my QR code list. And well, let's see, the uh, vocab chance. Yep, I want them to watch this three times this week. So I uh, click that guy and I add it to my QR code list. Mm, let's see, how about some interactive flashcards? Yeah, maybe the students can, can check the flashcards and um, complete the worksheet based on these. So I'm going to add this to my QR code list. Add that. And finally, I would like them to play one game. I've got three different games available here. A word search, um, the hangman game. Yeah, they probably like to play the hangman game. So I'll, I'll add this to my QR code list. And boom. So then what I can do is... It just creates this nice, convenient QR code list. Um, I, can, I can change the options so that I can have a QR code and a link, or I can have just a link. If you don't want to be printing for every single class or for every student, you can just send the data to um, all of your students via some mail client or uh, some app. And boom, I hit print, and it creates this really convenient PDF um, output. Or I could print the uh, I could print it on paper if I needed to, and we're done. So then, um, yeah, basically I have uh, ten levels currently from you know the ages of three up until the end of junior high school, but about ten levels that we're using. And so for every week, I create ten different QR code lists, and it it only takes me twenty minutes to plan for an entire week for you know hundreds of students. And that's great for the, uh, the other teachers because they know exactly what the students are going to be doing at home. So we can use those to, um, you know, teach around in our lessons. Okay, so it's um, <clears throat> another big question that people might have is, does it work? Well, um, I brought in a big stack of, of finished ones. When they bring it in, I actually tear them off. I sign off and I give them their stickers. But we have um, basically like, something like 90%, 95% of the students doing it. Uh, it kind of depends on the age group um, and the amount of stuff you're doing, but we ask them to do maybe five. So if they, um, <clears throat> if they watch a video one time, they can color it. That'd be, that would count as one time. We ask them to do five. If you do five or more, that's great. We have students cons uh, consistently doing everything. And if we have, um, you know, summer vacation, 
like maybe we have a two week break, we'll give them a double sided page. Holy cow, they do everything. And um, it, it works. We've got students this year who uh, maybe if they're, you know, in my, my three year olds or my four year old classes where they're before we haven't taught phonics specifically. Um, but now they come in and they can say the, the, they can spell the words, they can read more words, um, and we haven't taught it in classes yet. So this is proof that flipped learning is, is much more effective. And it's a tool that if you can find a system that's, that's um, working for all or most of your students, you're going to be in a, in a great situation. Um, so that's one thing I, I highly want to recommend for anyone who's, who's teaching, whether it's online, offline. Yeah, if you can flip your classroom... The more you have them study at home on their own, the better results you're going to get. And I think the more popular, if you're in a business, you know, if you're trying to get more students, then yeah, this is definitely uh, going to help out. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, jump into example number two. And on this is, uh, it kind of ties in with the QR codes, but this is another example of something we've been doing that, that motivates kids, something they can do at home. And we've been creating these lesson videos uh, for our students. So I'm going to go to our website here, uh, Step by Step Kids. And uh, up in the, the top right, we've got this um, this link. Uh, actually, my students have the QR code or the link for it anyway, but uh, I click here. And we have a page of, of online mini lessons. Um, you can, I guess you can call it that. And this is our old, um, this is still up from Christmas. We haven't updated it. We're going to update it next week with our New Year's version. But what we do is we sit down and we create a cool little Hi, lesson. Hi, Hi, Jeremy. All right. And how about- so we do this kind of TV style, like, hey, we do an interview or, you know, we're going to watch um, some little videos in the, in the side of the screen. So in this video, what I do is um, I have a target sentence. This our phrase today. What do you want for Christmas? One, two. What, what do you want, want for Christmas? Christmas? So the students would be at home watching this, uh, maybe on their parents' phone, if they're really young learners, and they would be practicing along. Okay, so that's good. We get them uh, practicing. But then we put it in context, and we, we interview every one of our staff members uh, or you know other people that we want, and it looks something like this. Ask me, Hiro, what do you want for Christmas? One, two. What, what do, do you, you want, want for Christmas? Christmas? All right, let's check her answer. What do I want for Christmas? Hmm. All, All right, right, so then well, we have- what happens is it turns into a little quiz. This one is a little more elaborate than our past videos. Here they actually get to choose from the graphics uh, what does she want for Christmas, and you get to guess she wants a, or you can just practice the vocab, she wants a car, she wants a video game. So let's see how a that works. red car. One, two. She, she wants, wants a red car. car. And again, we know that students are watching this based on the view count of the video um, or just from the, the number of times they've, they've signed it um, on their at-home challenge, their QR code list. Once a bicycle? What do you think? Please say your answer. All right. Want a red car. Oh! Okay, so she wants a red car. Now, um, if I've actually been using this in our lessons as well. We'll spend a lot of time uh, practicing it together, and I'll, I'll, st- I'll stop the video in class. I'll ask them, and uh, it's been really fun. Uh, it's a great way to kind of mix up the lesson plans once in a while. So I, I really recommend if you can make your own videos um, <clears throat> and then add them to a, a QR code list, the students are going to love it and get a lot out of it. Now, for these... Um, one thing you'll notice is that there are no ads. I've noticed that YouTube is getting really ad heavy. And so even now, if I, I go to pause the video, uh, advertisements or weird stuff pops up in the middle of the video and I can't use it to practice. Okay, she wants a red car. So you'll find that you can just put your videos um, in your, if you have you know, OneDrive or Dropbox, you can put them anywhere there. Um, Amazon has a, a really cheap you know, hosting service. You can put videos there. And once you do that, um, you can just link to the videos using the fun box like I uh, illustrated just a moment ago. So let's go back to our fun box here and I'll show you how that works. <clears throat> so if you wanted to add your own content to a QR code using Bingo Bongo's uh, ABC fun box, you would go to the my menu and at the bottom here you've got free writing and then you've got custom QR or link. 
And so here, this is nice. All I have to do is type in any link I want uh, and make a QR, and it gets built right into that list uh, that I've already uh, I built just before. So let me zoom out here a little bit. So you can see there's my list, and here's my custom link. So you could actually use the ABC Fun Box and do, uh, you know, 6, 10, 100 of your own QR codes, uh, your own links. And you'll find it's a quick way to add the link, the QR code, uh, and package it in a, in a simple format that your students can take advantage of. Okay, so um, I think those are the two examples that um, have really been uh, great for us. Um, I've got tons of other stuff that I would love to talk about, but I want to keep these um, these webinars kind of short and just kind of scratch the surface of some topics, and that way we can find out what people are interested in. And also, we'll be taking questions. So, uh, of course, if you have any questions, type them into the Zoom chat. If you're watching this live, if you have questions after the webinar, feel free to uh, contact us. Uh, you can see the link, uh, the the email address is at the bottom of the screen, info at bingobongokids.com. And uh, comments, questions, uh, suggestions for future topics, uh, anybody that you think might want to be a guest. Um, today I'm doing a, a solo presentation, but starting next week, uh, we're going to be doing a, a question answer format with uh, a different guest. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, plug that right now. So next week, if you are free on January 21st, 2022, from 8 p.m. Uh, in Japan, uh, that's the time in Japan, we're going to be uh, talking with Adam Cardos. He's uh, a really amazing, uh, I think a small publisher. He's got a couple different um, books. He's got a whole curriculum. I know he has an international kindergarten, uh, a language school, and all kinds of other projects. He's won tons of awards, and he's created this Gamerized Dictionary. And uh, he says, or I should say, we're going to talk about how he uses that in his uh, school uh, to, again, incorporate that into flipped learning or the flipped classroom. Pretty much what we've been talking about today. So how to start getting better results in class. That's next, next week. And I highly recommend it. Um, Adam mentioned to me that he doesn't use paper. He doesn't use physical paper in uh, his classes after a certain age. So that's that's kind of like, pff, ah, mind blown. I want to hear how he does that and uh, hear what his results are in terms of uh, using flipped learning. So that's something we will definitely um, check out next week. So please join us. Uh, if you can't join us next week, then please check out the video after it is um, recorded and added to the, the website. Um, and yeah, go to bingobongokids.com. And you can find all of our, our webinars just by checking our blog. It's pretty easy to track that down. All right. So I think I'll, um, I'll pause there for today. And let's jump into question time. So if anyone has any questions, then uh, by all means, throw those into the Zoom chat box. Um, and we'll, we'll take those now. So uh, I got to say thanks to uh, my trusty sidekick, Mihiro. Uh, she's our <laughs> manager and CEO of Step by Step. She's been helping me compile the questions and get everything ready to go here. Uh, so if you have any questions, please throw them in. I'll start with a couple that have been prepared. Uh, so the first question is, uh, how much is the ABC Fun Box? Uh, so what I can do is we can jump back into the ABC Fun Box. And let's see, I can find the student membership prices here. The uh, there are two uh, payment plans for the ABC Fun Box, and let me see if I can find. Uh, so first, uh, under membership plans, the teacher would need uh, a membership plan, and for the teacher membership plan, we have let's see a basic or a plus. If you just wanted to have uh, access to all of the worksheets, videos, and download anything uh, that we make that's uh, printable, uh, or the videos, that's about five hundred yen per month. If you want the um, the plus package, it's about a thousand yen per month, uh, and if you actually sign up for a yearly subscription, the price drops significantly. So, for example, the teacher plus uh, subscription for a year is uh, it would be twelve thousand yen per uh, for a year if you paid monthly, but it's seven thousand eight hundred yen per year. So it's about um, yeah six hundred fifty yen a month um, for the teacher. Plus plan, and that gives you access to everything 
uh, all of the worksheets, all the videos, all the interactive games. Uh, so that's really cool. Um, now, let's see. We also have an institution plan. So for bigger schools that wanted to have multiple accounts using the Funbox at the same time, <clears throat> you would need the... Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Choose an option. I would need the uh, institution plan, which I have lost. And plus, choose an option. Uh, okay, so institution here. And up to five devices. And um, this is a little more expensive. It's 24,000 yen per year. But that gives you access to uh, more accounts on the phone box. And it also gives you access to downloads of complete curriculum levels. So if you wanted to have everything that we make, all of our worksheets, books, and everything, and just download it all to your computer in one go, then this would be the plan to choose. <clears throat> now, uh, on top of that, after um, the students, uh, the teachers have their memberships, depending on the resource that you choose, uh, you may or may not need a, a student membership as well. So for example, if I were to just send a worksheet solution to my students, uh, you can see here there, uh, there is nothing about uh, student membership required. But if you go to the red ones, the interactive uh, games and resources, then at the bottom you can see it says student basic membership required. Okay, so how much are the student memberships? Well, <clears throat> Um, if a student, if a parent, for example, just wanted to um, sign up, let me see if I can find that. That would be student memberships here. Um, <clears throat> I have a chart here. So if, if just one parent wanted to sign up for their, their, uh, their student or their child, then the monthly regular price is 400 yen per month. But if they pay for a full year, uh, then it would be 320 yen per month or um, about 4,000 yen per year. Now, if a school decides that, hey, we should have all of our students using this to take advantage of the flipped learning and get the most out of it, <clears throat> then uh, if the school, for example, had 21 to 50 students, then the monthly payment price drops based on the number of student memberships you purchase in bulk. So that would be about 300 yen per month. Or if you pay uh, for the full year, then uh, 280 yen. So for, for larger schools of 100 uh, students or more, then you're looking at as low as 240 yen um, per month. So yeah, there are uh, a lot of details um, in there, but if you have any questions, please send us a message and we can, um, yeah, answer anything <clears throat> that's unclear there. Uh, let's see. So jumping into our, our next question here. Um, what do you do if the students don't use the QR code lists at home? <clears throat> Okay, so that's a good question. Um, with our, our previous uh, method, we had a, a piece of paper. We asked them to go home, and um, they would, you know, watch the, the video on the DVD or uh, listen to the track on the CD. And some students were doing it, uh, or they started out doing it, you know, religiously, and then they kind of they lost interest or they stopped doing it. And so, yeah, um, that's the biggest uh, struggle or hurdle with flipped learning programs is getting everyone on board. And we've we've had a lot of success now with the the ABC Fun Box uh, and the QR code system, so that's definitely working. If we have students who aren't um, aren't doing it, then it tends to be um, more about the the environment at home. Are the parents on board? Um, do they understand how to to use it? Um, obviously, a child, if they're <clears throat> three or four years old, they don't have a, a smartphone or a tablet. They can't do this on their own. So the parents need to be involved in that process. So I think um, having a strong uh, communication uh, channel with the parents to you know, explain how the system works is really, really important to getting a successful um, success rate out of the flipped learning So, um, yeah, otherwise, if they don't do it, it, it can be a challenge because... Um, they're going to fall behind. And if you have 90% of your students who can learn at home and come in and practice communicating uh, communication, then the students who haven't learned it at home, they're going to feel lost pretty quickly. So that is a, a, <clears throat> a difficult question, I think. Um, okay, so next, when are the uh, prepared QR codes going to be ready? So like I said, we're going to have on the, uh, the fun box, let me pull that guy up here. Um, and by the way, if 
if you're watching live on Zoom right now and the the resolution looks pretty um, low, it's because that's just one of the drawbacks of Zoom. We're going to have a, a high definition uh, recording of this available on our site um, as soon as this is done. So you can check that out if you want to see um, in more detail. <clears throat> okay, so then here we go. We're on the website. And if you go to any, um, I can bring down the search menu here and I can search by level unit or I can search by book page. And so with the level unit system, for every single level, for every single unit, and for every single lesson, you can launch any worksheet. <clears throat> and on the left si left hand side, in my menu, you're going to have unit info, worksheet info, and lesson ideas. So this is where you're going to find um, two things. Right now, it's, it's kind of under construction coming soon. We're hoping to have all of this set by the end of February, uh, end of March at the latest. Um, but it'll tell you all of the vocabulary. <clears throat> You'll be able to download the curriculum card. You can see the unit song. Uh, and it'll help you prepare your lesson plans this way. Or with our lesson ideas, we'll basically have, okay, we recommend you know a warm-up activity here, and we recommend a review activity here, and then you, know, you can work on this in class. Or, um, yeah, we'll have some different patterns, whether it's an online teacher or, um, yeah, a classroom teacher. But we'll have those, and we'll also have the recommended student QR codes. So you can download those. Um, but hopefully we'll have all of that ready by uh, the start of next school year. Uh, in April of 2022. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, let's see. Uh, the next question is, do you think it's better to explain? Uh, I think this might just be a, a question uh, for just, you know, teaching a, a second language in general. But is it more beneficial to explain how to do the activities in the child's native language. So for example, if I'm teaching students uh, in Japan, if the students are Japanese, and I want them to do an activity, should I try to explain how to do the activity in English? Or should I use the native language Japanese so that they can understand um, the process uh, a little bit faster? <clears throat> and I, there are definitely two camps, um, I think, on this topic. Uh, it's widely debated. Should you do all English all the time? Or um, the other idea would be, yeah, use their native language to explain how to do the activity. And once they know how to do it, then you can spend more time doing the activity and maybe um, reinforce <clears throat> or teach the concepts uh, more efficiently. And I personally, um, with, with children that are, um, you know, three, four, five years old, it's pretty hard to explain um, concepts using only English is what I found. But not all teachers have, you know, if you're an English teacher and you don't speak any Japanese, you don't really have the choice. But I personally don't mind using Japanese uh, if I think it's necessary. Um, some, I know some schools might have uh, a manager who's Japanese who can come in and help and explain things. And then you have, you can, you know, switch over to, to only English would be one way to approach that. <clears throat> and then another thing that I have found um, that has just helped me overall as, a, as an educator as, as teaching ESL or EFL is having a really um, well-planned process for every single lesson. So whether it's the first lesson of you know the first year or the last lesson of their their tenth year studying, having a routine that the kids get familiar with uh, is really beneficial. And so uh, what I do is I always start the class with, uh, "Can I come in?" The students have to ask me, "Can I come in, please?" And then we take attendance, and then we talk about the weather, we talk about the date. And so if a new student were to come into that scenario, that situation, they would be able to look at the other students and learn very quickly through peer learning. And maybe they wouldn't need the explanation in Japanese. Um, so, yeah, having a, a solid routine um, is a very important and valuable tool for any teacher, uh, any language teacher. And that, I think, will be a future topic for one of our webinars in this series. So, <clears throat> um, yeah. Well, uh, I think that wraps up the, uh, the few questions that we did have. So, um, yeah, like I said, I want to keep these, you know, webinars short and sweet and just kind of talk about a couple things. And if there's, you know, follow-up questions, comments, feedback, we would love to hear that at info at bingobongokids.com. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, uh, our, next, uh, our next speaker 
Our, uh, next week, we're going to have a great guest, which I, I definitely hope everyone can join us for. So come come back, and we'll sp- we'll, we're going to spend a lot more time talking about flipped learning, how to get better results in class, and we're going to be speaking with Adam Cardos, who's he's a heavy hitter uh, in this topic, so it's going to be really good. All right. Well, I want to say thank you for everyone that joined today uh, on everyone who's watching after the fact um, from our website. And this has been Bingo Bongo Learning's webinar, uh, webinar series for ESL, EFL teachers. Take care. See you again. Bye.